It's a familiar premise. We've all seen hundreds and hundreds of movies, whether it's the Marvel movies or James Bond, they all get to a point where the world's about to end. And I just think narrative is really powerful. And in some ways, maybe we all think as not only people, but as audience members, that it's just going to work out. You know, there's, there's this kind of tradition of using love as a theme for something more than just two people kissing. So. I guess on some level, that's what we're trying here. It's a mistake, I think, for a filmmaker to pursue themes. You know, in his, it, this is a mistake, I think. I, I, I think themes have to emerge from a story that is uh, based in, in fact. I loved how the story kept evading your best expectations and bringing it home in a way that felt true and um, yet surprising, which is, I think, the best quality of a great story. And so one of the things that I do is to write backstories for my characters. Yeah. And actually, I have some of these backstories acted out by the actors themselves, because by actually acting out the backstory, it doesn't become just ideas and, and thoughts, but in fact, it becomes memory and experience. There, I, I had a, an appetite for that book, and I wanted the people who had loved the book as much as I did will find some respect of, uh, uh, of the world, of the poetry of the book. At the same time, I wanted my mother to understand the movie. I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to the people that don't knew nothing about this world will feel welcome. I think it's, it's um, inherently dramatic to tell the truth about something, but in particular, to tell the truth about something you're not supposed to talk about. You know, to tell the truth about something taboo. One thing I told myself in this was that I wouldn't try and, too hard to ape the brilliance of, of yeah. my, my former colleagues, but what I would try and do was not second guess my instinct. The, the real goal was to sort of, um, and I think I'm at this time in my life, you're grateful for your experience, but you really want to let your imagination to be as free as you can. It felt to me more dramatic to focus the story on the time in their family's life when, when all the chips were on the table. It was important to me that these characters are flawed and messed up and not defined by their deafness. I started just talking to a lot of people and scientists and I kept looking for good news right. and I never got it. Everything I was hearing was worse than what I was hearing on the mainstream media. And so I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a journalist, David Sirota, and we were both just like, can you believe that this isn't being covered in the media, that it's being pushed to the end of the story? There's no headlines. And Sirota just offhandedly said, uh, it's like a comet's headed to Earth and no one, it's going to destroy us all and no one cares. Mm. And I just was like, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about it was it's a familiar premise. We've all seen hundreds and hundreds of movies, whether it's you know, Towering Inferno or the Marvel movies or James Bond, they all get to a point where the world's about to end and they all work out just fine. Right. And I just think narrative is really powerful. And in some ways, maybe we all think as not only people, but as audience members, that it's just going to work out. It's um, interesting how love challenges us when it comes to defining ourselves. And I think a lot of the films that I've made up until now deals a lot with sense of identity and loss and who are who am I and at this stage in life and so forth and so in this film I wanted to kind of make a story about a young person Julie she's about to turn 30 and she's kind of lost in the situation where she doesn't know how to appreciate herself and she doesn't know how to figure out her love life and I there's a tradition in cinema that's dealing with love as an existential question if you look back at George Cukor's wonderful films from the 30s and 40s or Eric Romer, now that we are in France, you know, there's, there's this kind of tradition of using love as a theme for something more than just two people kissing. So I guess on some level, that's what we're trying here. It's a mistake, I think, for a filmmaker to, to um, pursue themes, you know, in his, it, this is a mistake, I think. I, I, I think themes have to emerge from a story 
that is uh, based in, in fact, uh, that, has, uh, that is entertaining to an audience, uh, and that hopefully has comedic and dramatic possibilities. The themes um, have to grow quite naturally from that. You know, I, I, it's sort of, I remember hearing about people that were songwriters that would think, oh, you know, I used to have to sit down and try and write a hit song, right? They wanted to write like a hit song. And they said that, oh, just they could never do it, right? And then if they were lucky enough to have a hit song, they just happened to be like sitting at breakfast one morning, buttering their toast and something came into their mind and they, and they, and they wrote it. Um, I think this is a, it's a more a organic way to work. But I really, as I know you do, I really, really, really enjoy working with writers. So when you, when you work with your Chris, Chris Weitzes and your Michael Greens and you know, Scott Franks and people like this, these, these are very, very impressive uh, no. wordsmiths. And the way, you know, the way they, the way they handle story and, um, and then this sort of balance, and for me, to answer your question in terms of a sort of um, jumping off point, uh, was trying to absorb uh, what you learn from people like that, the, the fantastic uh, understanding of the grammar of a film, particularly certain kinds of genres and how the sort of the, the mechanics of those work. But then they always know, and this is um, where I sort of left off, when to sort of try and let it fly. One thing I told myself in this was that I wouldn't try and, too hard to ape the brilliance of, of yeah. my, my former colleagues, but what I would try and do was not second guess my instinct about um, a certain kind of Irishness that I suppose is in the writing, i.e. sometimes it's episodic, or maybe it's always episodic and stream of consciousness -y, or it's full of vivid moments, but I didn't, I didn't worry too much about those things that I remember as a younger filmmaker, and well, the inciting incident has to be on page 20, and you know, the, the big thing needs to happen at the end of the first act, and then you need yeah. to recalibrate something. I let that go and uh, try to um, capture, even if it wasn't direct, sort of spirit of things like the way my grandfather uh, spoke, who did quote a bit of poetry from time to time, and Kieran Hines does get to, to quote a bit of Yeats. Yes. And, um, and so uh, the, the real goal was to sort of, um, and I think I'm at this time in my life, you're grateful for your experience, but you really want to let your imagination to be as free as you can. So when it was brought to me, it was always kind of through the lens of Richard, but I felt like that was really an interesting way to, to tell this story, because I think we all know what Venus and Serena go on to have gone on to achieve in their, in their lives, but it felt to me more dramatic to focus the story on the time in their family's life when, when all the chips were on the table and that there was a real um, precarious situation of whether or not this huge gamble that they had made as a family was gonna work. And that, that window seemed to me the, the most dramatic and it really distilled their journey down to something that was, you know, was a movie. But the thing is that uh, uh, I will state the obvious. The idea was that uh, it was important for me to uh, honor honor the dream that uh, when I read the book to try, uh, I, I, I had uh, an appetite for that book and I wanted the people who had loved the book as much as I did will, will find some respect of, uh, uh, of the world, of the poetry of the book. At the same time, I wanted my mother to understand the movie. I wanted to uh, to uh, to the people that don't, knew nothing about this world will feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to balance uh, information, there are so many cultures, uh, so many tribes in this, in this uh, um, to, to find the right balance. So to give enough, you know, it's like, a, uh, um, and not uh, put uh, too much uh, in, uh, exposition at the beginning uh, that, uh, that would crush the other, uh, the audience would feel crushed under the, the, the amount of information that it was, that was probably the, 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 for me, the main challenge. I would say that at the beginning of the book, the book starts by saying uh, some, something like uh, beginnings are very delicate times. And I will say that definitely the, <laughs> how to open this movie was the, the big challenge, how to approach it. At the beginning, we tried to be more faithful to the book and realize quickly that, not quickly, not quickly. We realized at one point after a lot of work that we had to deviate a little bit uh, from the book in order to make a, a softer, a more gentle introduction to the world so people will have enough uh, uh, in their, uh, enough knowledge to, 
not feel lost uh, at the beginning there. Yeah. I, I just found that the story kind of really flowed in in a very interesting, different way between the four characters. And then when finally um, Phil and uh, Peter start to get close and that excludes Rose and worries her and, you know, like obviously Phil is a character not to take literally with, you know, when he appears to want to make friends with Peter, he could be very dangerous in many different ways, you know. Um, and she has every reason to be suspicious, I think. And But, you know, I, I loved how the story kept evading your best expectations and bringing it home in a way that felt true and um, yet surprising, which is, I think, the best quality of a great story. What's so beautiful and immersive about this film are the reflective moments with the characters. And it's so nice to think about what the characters are thinking about. You're, you're capturing the actor's thoughts. When working with the actors, did you have a particular process in place that gave them the tools to color in the gray spaces? Well, if the audience is able to keep watching and can continue to feel something even though the actors themselves are not speaking, I think that's really because the actors themselves are feeling something when they're uh, playing those roles. They're not just standing there, they're feeling something. They're not just doing what they were told, but that they are in fact living their own interpretations of the characters in front of the camera. I realized though that this is a very difficult task and so as a director, I want to do my best at helping them get to that place. And so one of the things that I do is to write backstories for my characters. And actually, I have some of these backstories acted out by the actors themselves. Because by actually acting out the backstory, it doesn't become just ideas and, and thoughts, but in fact, it becomes memory and experience. We acted out the relationship between Kafuku and Oto um, and their relationship as a couple. And to have that memory be physicalized for this to become physical memory I think can be of help for the actors especially in these quiet moments when they don't necessarily have things to say I think their body can actually help because their body remembers acting out these pasts. I, I knew I wanted to try to adapt this book and that I could do totally privately in my room no one has to see it unless I want them to but I did need the rights and so I, I, I appealed to Ferrante, the um, author, for the rights, and she's anonymous, so there's no way to communicate with her except by email. So I write to her and I said, I want to direct it. I did say that, and I want to adapt it. And I told her not how I was going to adapt it, because at that wow. point I, I really didn't know, but I told her why I wanted to adapt it, which I can tell you if you want. But, but I, so what I told her was, I said, okay, her book, is so honest. I mean, that's the thing that's so compelling about it. I think it's it's um, inherently dramatic to tell the truth about something. Yes. But in particular, to tell the truth about something you're not supposed to talk about. You know, to tell the truth about something taboo. Even like in a room, if you're like, let me tell you something, it's a secret. Yeah. Everybody leans in. And, and that's exactly what she was doing, right? She's talking about the experience of being a woman in the world in a way that I had never heard expressed before. Secret right. things where you're like, holy shit, I cannot believe you said that out loud. I'm, I'm, I'm a little freaked out and I'm electrified and comforted to know I'm not the only one who has like, you know, perverse, dark feelings. Feelings, yeah. Yeah. And so I said to her, wouldn't it be interesting if instead of all of these people having this experience reading your novels alone in our rooms, where in some ways it still remains a secret, these truthful things that she's putting out there, what if we could put it on a screen? What if we could actually hear these things spoken out loud in a communal space where you might be sitting next to your husband or your mother or your daughter or your lover or whatever? and have to sit next to them and hear these things said out loud. I was like, well, that would be yeah. really radical. Then yeah. the cat's really out of the bag. Then you cannot put it back in, you know? So, and so she said, to get back to your first question, she said, yes, you can have the rights, but only if you direct it. You know, you talked about the, the mom-daughter relationship. It's like, it was important to me that these characters 
are flawed and messed up and not defined by their deafness. So like Jackie is a narcissist. Like she doesn't say if I was blind, would you want to paint because she's deaf and she's hurt? You know, I think it's coming out of pure narcissism of like, well, you are clearly a teenager who's doing everything in reaction to me. And the only reason you would be pursuing something is as a fuck you to me. So I think there's just a kind of interesting coming of age for everyone in the movie um, that the parents have to evolve and grow up as well. 